Hello, dear listeners of Apocalypse uh, Apie Kokibe. Our topic for today is from framework to product. So if you work in an industry long enough, there is a high chance that you created something awesome. And maybe you want to pump it up and release it somehow, make it a product. And that's what we're going to talk today from Riga. And we have uh, two guests which did just that. So please introduce yourself. Um, hi, uh, I'm Arturx. I am the CTO of Lodero. Um, I started in quality assurance about seven years ago. Um, and yeah, as, as you just said, like I kind of started to work on, on a framework that uh, eventually turned itself into what we know as Lodero today. Hey, uh, I'm Pavels. I joined Lodero more than two years ago as a sales specialist when it was becoming a product rather than a project. So my job was to grow it as a product and as a business. And now I work as a CMO and I'm responsible for all the marketing and sales activities for it. So we probably can start uh, from the background of that uh, Lodero. So performance testing and specifically load testing. So what are those things? So essentially, generally, when you think about testing, most people start by thinking about functional testing. So does this button work? Does it look like as it's supposed to look and, and, and all of that stuff, uh, which is which is the, like it's important. It's what, what makes the application actually work. But um, the, the other thing that is that is something people don't think about is how, how well does the application work? Like uh, we've all seen websites that take ages to load and, and so on and so forth. And um, that that's where performance testing comes in. Like you want to make sure that the page loads quickly, that um, that it doesn't use all the CPU. Like uh, we have Chrome for that. And um, yeah, so pretty much all of those, those non-functional things, they all combine into performance testing um, and Performance testing obviously has a lot of different areas, um, and uh, yeah, like we kind of intentionally, unintentionally started to focus on load testing. And uh, load testing is specifically to find out does your application handle X amount of participants, X amount of concurrent sessions, to say. Um, I don't know. You can uh, you can think about it as as an e-commerce store handling uh, one thousand um, checkouts at the same time. Like, does the payment engine uh, can handle it? Does the warehouse can handle it? Like, um, normally you test with one or two people. I don't know in your company at the same time, so it, it should be fine. But when you like one of the examples could be Black Friday, right? There's a, a yeah, huge exactly. Spike. Black Friday is actually a great example. Um, because most like e-commerce stores, they're used to like their daily traffic. They know their average daily users and so on. But um, Black Friday deals come along and Cyber Monday and all of those events. And in those days, if you especially if you have huge discounts, like you, you have so such a big influx of customers coming in. And we're like load testing helps to prepare for those events. Um, it, it applies to both like websites and uh, other kinds of applications as well. Like you, you could even apply load testing to, I don't know, um, over the air updates for your car, maybe like if you roll out a patch and suddenly, I don't know, all, all models of that car start downloading it, it's, it's probably not going to end well. Maybe we could also, uh, kind of explain <coughs> what is the difference between performance testing and load testing, or is it maybe the same thing or maybe it's, uh, it's different just by purpose of it. Yeah. Uh, load testing is a subset of performance testing. Um, in, in performance testing, um, you're kind of trying to, to determine all the performance aspects. It, it has many disciplines. Um, it could be, I don't know, how much network the, the web page uses. It could be how much CPU it uses, how quickly it loads and a, a lot of different metrics like these. And like for, for bigger products, like uh, historically, I don't know, for banking and government products, um, they have defined limits on, on what the product, product is supposed to handle. Like um, in the purchase agreement, often it says like the page should load, I don't know, in under five seconds. 
like to determine that it's performance testing and load testing is, is a subset of that making sure that the application will be able to handle a thousand concurrent sessions or or a hundred thousand concurrent sessions like um yeah that's a that's a subset of performance testing and also a similar related discipline is stress testing which a lot of people actually confuse stress testing and load testing and the main difference is that load testing we're trying to understand uh, does the site handle thousand users in stress testing we're trying to, to determine that number like load testing tries to go to thousand stress testing uh, tries to go until the website completely crashes and is unusable and then we know that okay it handled 1251 users Okay. So basically, it's the same, but the purpose or it's the same but different. different right? The goal is different, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The goal is different. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So it seems that load testing could be quite important for the success of the product in the market, right? Yeah, that's actually the case, because uh, even if it's an established business already, like a big e-commerce store, and you know that it performs fine for you, but then there is this big event like Black Friday. First of all, you invest heavily in marketing for this event. Second, th this is uh, the spike in traffic. It's not typical for the store. It doesn't happen every day or every week. So it might not be ready. And there is this combination. It is a big day. It is a big investment. And if it doesn't work out, you lose everything. You lose the money in the marketing. You lose the impression of the user who came for the first time just because there was the big sale and stuff like that. And it's not, not only about the e-commerce. Like... Um, now there are a lot of virtual events, uh, application platforms, and uh, essentially when there is the online event, a lot of people come online to the website at the same time. And if you can't handle the load and you provide the service of online events, basically the business doesn't work, the product doesn't work. Not treating load testing as something important can actually have a big negative impact on the whole business. Yeah, and if there's competition, uh, if you don't can handle it, but your competition can, it means that they are winning the business. So, and it's kind of quite competitive market actually. From what, uh, 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 how it feels to me is like uh, if uh, the business has to be uh, in sync with the actual uh, development team, right? If I have an e-commerce, I'm an owner, right? And I know that this is going to be a, a huge event, right? I, my uh, business part does the commercial uh, put commercials everyone about the product and the technical team is not aware of that for example and then one day the app crashes the business is angry they lost money they spent a lot of money on this commercial and the technician is like you didn't tell us like we didn't know that we need to do yeah but my, my personal feeling is actually that people treat uh, load testing similarly to cyber security like it's fine until there's an incident like we've heard a lot of times in the news, like there's this data leak from some company, there's those passwords leaked. I don't know, a couple of years back, Twitter leaked passwords. Like it, it was fine until it leaked. Like, and, and it's the same for load. Like uh, we're talking about events here. There are scheduled events also happening. Like, uh, I don't know, submitting tax returns. Like every year we know that the system crashes. They, they know that the system crashes and still it's fine because like, yeah. All right, so maybe let's move on to another topic as we talked about the users and uh, their expectations. So can you tell us more about the customer expectations that usually are wrong or not justified? Like how customer comes in and probably it comes to you with a request, make a performance testing for us or something like that. First of all, I can say that there are two different approaches how people approach this. First is when you already had an issue, when you already didn't handle the load and you come and say, okay, now we need to load test to see what's the problem, to fix it and move further. And it's a different case when the person is uh, aware of the importance and he comes in advance and say, okay, we don't know how many visitors can we handle, but we must know this in order to understand when we should improve. Uh, usually, for this case, when people come and they want to do load testing, their expectations about uh, the performance and scalability of their applications are very high. I mean, I work in a client-facing position, so I hear this a lot. I, uh, I ask them, 
what is your plan? How many concurrent users do you plan to have during a load test and measure the performance of your application? And if they say 10,000 concurrent visitors, usually that means that uh, their website can handle between two and 5,000. So if they say 100,000, usually they can handle 10,000, maybe. So 10 times less, more yeah. or less. I can't say that it is always the case, but it is a really common thing. Uh, I hear this very often. Uh, the other similar expectation is when you use some kind of a third party infrastructure or API or uh, some kind of the product, you expect it to perform good. And uh, some people think that if you use a very widely known big product that for sure is scalable enough for you, this automatically means that your product built on that is as scalable. But of course, that's not the case because uh, you know, developing a software product is a very complex task and there is a lot of room to do something wrong and this can create a new bottleneck and yes, the service you use can scale perfectly but your application breaks when 1000 concurrent visitors come and this isn't even a high number. Yeah, and I think also that um, there are a lot of customers that come to us in the last minute. Um, many people consider low testing as a verification, not as actually testing that, hey, how much does it does it handle the thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand? They come to hear that it's just to verify it. Like they had like requirements specified by the business people that it needs to handle ten thousand, so we'll just do the low testing to just uh, have the confirmation. And they do the low testing and they see that, oh no, it's not actually ten thousand, it's those two thousand or whatever. And they have to do fixes and like, and it takes time. It and takes the, a lot and the of time. Day is usually. tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of projects that come to us on a, on a Wednesday and say, "Hey, we are releasing next month, Monday, and we need to do load testing." Like, on on our side, that means we need to prepare tests. We need to like familiarize ourselves with the application and everything. Do the load tests, and then like our expectation is that the application fails. Like it's it's not that everyone will fail, but statistics show that they will. Like if you guess you uh, that the app will fail, you will be more right more times than wrong, right? Yeah, I would also say that the the companies that come to us well in advance are generally more prepared, and for those, I'd say the success rate is much higher. The people that come to us in the last minute. Either they're just throwing a lot of money at servers just to make sure they reach the numbers or they haven't done anything regarding performance, like uh, improvements for their application and they're just expecting everything to just work. So kind of a advice would be for our listeners, if you are in a position where you can advise your business or someone or you are going to be asked to do a performance testing, keep in mind that they might and probably will fail and there is going to be some time needed to fix those issues and repeat the test until those issues are fixed. Yeah, exactly. Like most of the time, as, as Pavel said, like if the application handles 2000 users instead of the expected 10, our, our experience shows that we it, it doesn't matter to start with 10,000. We, we, we need to start small and fail somewhere in the middle and then do repeated rounds of testing and all of that takes time. You, you can't do it in two days. So you have a solution for, for that kind of problem, how to test the load. Uh, can you talk about it, explain what it is? Um, yeah, so we've been talking about what, what is performance, what is load testing. Obviously, we have a solution for that. So Lodero um, is, is a product that is meant to test um, other web-based products. So what we're doing um, is we are using UI automation, so using a web page UI automation and scaling it up in, in an, quite an enormous scale. So uh, that's why we are kind of actually in a niche, but a niche that physically exists there. And uh, like generally when you do load testing, you're trying to do the load testing on a fairly low level. Uh, I don't know, just test an API or test just the database or something like that. What we are focusing on, we're focusing on doing end-to-end -end load testing. So um, 
as we're using UI automation, we're testing all the flows that are actually quite representative. Because in API load testing, you might skip login step or you might over test the login step. I don't know, maybe, for example, if we think of e-commerce, you're adding items to cart, um, I don't know, once per search, but you're searching like 50 times before you add the item to cart. If you did an API load test, you would most likely do one uh, request for searching item, one for adding item, one for checkout. Like that's not how proportions work out in real life. And what uh, Lodero achieves is we can actually do those proportions. We try to push our customers to try to like create scenarios that are very representative. And um, yeah, like it, it takes a lot of resources for us to boost that UI automation. Uh, because we're simulating actual browsers and like we all know who like it takes a lot of resources to do it so um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do we're doing uh, web application end-to-end -end load testing so in those cases um, like what I, I encountered that there's sometimes uh, server-side caching so yeah. you need to be not very random, but you need to make sure that either caching is disabled because if you will search for something once and you're going to do it 50 times, it means that it will not even, might not even reach the server. There might be some Redis cache which will return you a result because, well, you already asked for it or like there's like a similar search happened recently. So are you doing anything of that? Like how do you mitigate this? Well, we generally like... Um we're using the application kind of as the end user would use it. So, like, obviously not all end users will be searching, I don't know, for for 15-inch alloys on Amazon at the same time, right? So uh, we kind of need to create the tests uh, in a way that it's random enough, but uh, that's collaboration with our customer. Um, because we, we don't know the infrastructure that they have, um, Maybe they need to know the infrastructure. Maybe they, they don't have the cache and it doesn't really matter. Um, quite actually, a common place for this is login. M most applications do have login. And if you want to do something uh, reasonable, you have to log in. And it matters if you can use what, the same credentials for 10,000 users or you need 10,000 different users. And can you reuse those users in between tests? So that's actually something that we do need to think about. It's it goes customer by customer depending on on each individual situation. But um, we're we're doing that. Also, we have to like manage IP addresses because we're using some of them, some we're not, and then it depends. Yeah. So do you have any kind of questionnaire where you just uh, this is like something that we need your answer for clients and then you get the, all the answers and then you can come up with the, like scenarios and what needs to be done in order to get the actual results from load testing? Well, when we work on the test for the customers, that's basically the flow we have. We have the standard list of questions, but uh, when we get the answers, it's not yet enough to give the quote or give the understanding of what would be the load test. We need to do the exploration of the application itself before we can say how long does it take, how much resources it would take to test this. But as uh, Loader is available as a SaaS, a lot of our customers try or actually do successfully use it themselves. If they have the skills and knowledge to create the test, if they are capable, um, it's great for them because they know the infrastructure and the web uh, app like no other pe person. So it's easier for them to create a relevant test. But if they do have this knowledge of the infrastructure and the application, but are not capable to create the test, it means they need to involve someone uh, from our team, for example. And for us, it's an exploration from scratch because this is the first time we see this application and we need to make the load test as relevant, as close to the real world usage as possible for the customer. So I have a question about this. Someone told me that in uh, performance testing, the hardest part is to finding that scenario which is closest to the real world. Uh, so as understood, if, uh, for example, if I would like to do a performance test, I can use your product if I, am, if I can create a test, right? So technically. But how, how can I know what 
scenario is closest is there are there any guidelines on knowing how to or how do you recognize how do you create this real life uh, scenario because you know uh, it's a uh, it's very similar when uh, you come to someone else's house and you see how they use the computer and they they're well, they're using it differently than you are <laughs> maybe not the best way right so if uh, i work in one company right i'm so used to this product that i might be doing it correctly without knowing it and the new users they will do it differently like right they maybe not know the button or they will press different button each time and then move back and so on so how do you the question is how do you how what is the best way to find that scenario without even trying to write it down well you also asked about the guidelines i'm not sure if uh, these are available anywhere and if one yeah, can they, write the proper they guidelines are not, for that. they're not <laughs> so but maybe you can you know yeah, the best case scenario is you know your application you know your users you know what they do and you know that the majority of users would do this and that and you just simulate that uh, it's not always possible it's not always possible to know this much information about the users and sometimes uh, in many cases just the logic helps uh, if that's a virtual event for example so what would the visitors do they would uh, log in maybe then click to join the event, sit there, maybe use the chat, post something there. Uh, of course, there always will be users that have their own very special way of using your application that you would never come up yourself with. But uh, this is the minor case. It's not that common. So you shouldn't focus a lot on that when you do a load testing. Instead, you should focus on what is the most common, what the majority of the users do. So if you know that good if you don't try to think about the application and how it uh, is used in the real world it gives enough information to have a relevant load test that simulates the majority of the users okay and uh, some applications you know they are now trying to use google analytics or some kind of tool alike which tracks the user interactions uh, do you like tr look into those reports or they are not provided for you that often like i would say that generally this is not really our problem it's kind of customer's problem but um yeah as you, you said like you can use google analytics um i know that designers use a lot of similar tools to like explore user experience and see which areas of the product users are struggling with so i think i think a lot of those resources to define relevant and representative scenarios are actually in the company in, in different analytics already like using google analytics to find out what are the most common browsers locations screen sizes and stuff like that using resources provided by the design and ux team to find out what are scenario what are the scenarios like when user comes to this page how does a general user look like what does he do on the page so you can, you, I think you can tap into those resources to find out what are the users actually doing. And yeah, in case if you're like mm, testing for a specific event, then you already know that I'm focusing on the event. Like, I don't know if, it, if it's a live stream of something, what you need to test, you probably need to let test uh, login and the streaming stuff. You don't need to test settings and stuff like that. So you just rule those out. Also, as we discussed before, a lot of users come to load test their app when they already experience the problem. So in that case, they kind of know what caused it and when it happened, what were the users doing. Like if uh, they experienced the issue when a lot of users tried to log in, uh, it's a good idea to still have a load test with the, the usual user flow but to find where is the issue cause for this, you can create a load test just for the logging process because you know that it already caused the issues. So basically the advice uh, for listeners would be that it depends if you are, uh, if you or your company or your product have an experience the uh, the major breakdown right so then use all the resources available including analytics which might be in another design department or so on or maybe in accessibility like we talked about accessibility where they would 
gather some users and just uh, make a video how they work. Maybe that scenario could be also used for uh, performance test load. And the second case of the, of the users and products which need to do because of some reasons. So then just repeat that, right? So that would be good. Okay. So in the cases when you want to create a business, you have to have an idea which would be different from the com competitors. So what's a differentiator for Lodera? Because I believe there are more tools uh, which provide the similar services. Yeah, like um, for load testing, there are various different tools that are doing load testing. Um, and each, well, most tools focus on, on a specific kind of load testing. Uh, some tools, like I think most load testing tools actually focus on testing exactly APIs. So they're doing HTTP requests um, and just scaling those up. That's actually quite easy to do. Um, I don't know, you could you, you could use your laptop and, and a simple JavaScript to ramp up to like tens, tens of requests per second to, to just test your application like that. And if tens of requests is fine, then, then you might have done the load testing. Maybe you won't have the best metrics or reporting but you will have done a load test. What's different about Lodero is that we're doing an end-to-end -end load test. So most, uh, most people that uh, have, have a lot of time, a lot of development resources available, they will go, they probably will go to a lower level testing. They will do those API tests, but uh, those tests will require a bit more research to find out what's a representative scenario because you have to like find out what are the API requests made. Um, I've had a project in my experience that the customer wanted to do an API load test, but the API load test had to include getting all the static assets, every image, every JavaScript, every CSS file. It was, it was actually quite painful to create that scenario to like simulate how a browser would retrieve those resources. But with Lodero, you would just open the website as, as from a normal user's perspective. And um, I, I haven't actually seen a tool that does exactly that. And we do have customers that are coming to us that are more comfortable with UI automation instead of API automation. Um, and then there's another part of customers that come and that say that I like API automation alone is not enough for us. We need to do a full scale load test. I don't know they're using WebSockets or some other um, solution that just doesn't really apply to general load testing really well. So they want to use end to end testing like as an end user would have used their application. And that's what we do. And yeah, I don't know another application that does this really. And do you provide any feedback for how application on client side is working or only like well, what's the load on, on the back end happening if you use it from UI perspective? Well, we're actually mostly focusing on exactly the client side of the thing of things. Um, the thing about uh, back end metrics is that like there are a million flavors of Linux that people could be running their Windows servers. There are distributed, there are serverless. So there's so many different ways on how you could host your application and going into each one, tapping into the servers, getting access to servers and those metrics might be painful enough. Uh, but from end user perspective, like as long as the application is public, anyone can open the link. And if it's not public, we can uh, usually negotiate firewall rules much easier with the, with the customer if they want to test. So um, we're actually focusing more on client side metrics. And then if, uh, if server side metrics are relevant in those cases, we usually very closely collaborate with uh, ops or dev team, whoever is responsible for monitoring in the company. And uh, we, we communicate at which point we're starting the tests, at which point the user load is growing and stuff like this. So they can monitor. So that they wouldn't think that they are being under attack. Yeah, exactly. So well, generally they are aware, but uh, that's actually a mistake uh, some people do at first. That's something that we learned also the hard way with, with the customer that uh, 
like we communicated about running those tests but uh, we didn't explicitly say them that hey let your ops guys know that this is happening and they kind of freaked out at first um, but um, also our experience says that it's a very good idea to have somebody on site that can uh, bring the application back up there's, it, there's also like gateways if application is using gateway if they might think that you're ddosing them with the load and they can just block you or the continent or like depending on where it's coming the, those requests and you can basically well it, it's failing the the whole yeah. load testing right yeah so we yeah, need yeah. to turn it off yeah you you probably need to turn it off um it kind of depends so we've had cases when people explicitly want to test that ddos prevention system so they want to to us to run a lot of users at the same time just to make sure that DDoS prevention works. Well, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. So it can be used not only for load, but also for security testing, right? Well, <laughs> in a way. In a little way, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can write one test and you can use it for load, for stress, and for security testing. Amazing. I really feel uh, that second part about not uh, checking the client side, right? The, the back end, because if you want to run the proper test, right, you need to get, like, fill the request for proper access and wait. And if the company is big enough, there's like 21 day of turnover because seven different people need to approve your request. And then you get access to the server. It doesn't have any logs. You need to install the logs. You need to confirm them. You need to make sure that they work. And only then you can start running your test. And it's it takes such a long time if it's not uh, prepared properly beforehand. And that's the case if it's only one server, if it's a distributed architecture of 15 different instances that each have a specific role to play. Like it, it's, it just would take too long for us to learn all of that infrastructure to find out, okay, the server number nine is, is the faulty one. Yeah. If you want to test load, you are testing backend. It's still, it's not like you're testing the if can client side can happen because like there's like multiple client sides like in computers yeah, the, running, the but clients, load is on, on the, the server client side. client side, uh, client side is most of the time it's just JavaScript running on yeah. uh, client's computer. So it's, it's client's computer that's breaking. It's not really breaking, but like it, it might not handle it. But the, the load uh, itself, it like generates on the server side um but yeah like those it would be ideal that we could integrate server side metrics correlate them immediately to client side metrics on client side we usually see increased latencies um lower bit rates stuff like that we're running uh, a lot of tests for WebRTC applications so we're monitoring call quality and for those we more often see that the call quality starts dropping or it becomes unstable. Like uh, we're looking at stuff like standard deviation that at least for 10 users in a call, it's quite fine. Like it like varies about two frames per second. If we add 10 more users, it starts varying five frames per second on the, the videos. So a WebRTC is something that we can do, That something that we do uh, that is another niche uh, it has different metrics that we see a lot more on client side uh, for load testing on end to end side um, the big load tests the load tests that go into tens of thousands of users um, the client will be looking at back end metrics they, they will have ops teams that will be looking at areas that they are thinking that might be failing or if something unexpected fails, they will usually just say, OK, guys, there's something wrong. We'll investigate and come back to you tomorrow. But um, from client side, what we can su see is that, hey, the application stopped working. In many cases, like in all cases, we at least recommend to do so, that when we're running a load test, do, do manual testing at the same time. Because oh, just to feel that it is yeah exactly slower. because load testing it will be objective like if we're running automation automation will be objective if i said that the site needs to load in 10 seconds if it loads yes fine if it doesn't test fails right but it doesn't give the subjective feeling because checking for website to load it could be like i don't know check that login button appears Maybe it did appear, but it's all broken because CSS didn't arrive. 
or stuff like that. So that's what your subjective test will actually give you. So you ha you like generate the load using load error, you get metrics from load error still, but subjective uh, evaluation still needs to be done by a human being. So most of the time we have like a lot of people actually involved in, in load testing. Uh, it's like an event where everyone would uh, needs to be ready. Yeah, unless the developers are doing the monitoring, they can like rest for that time uh, until the results are in. But uh, everyone else usually is involved. A caveat actually is also Google Analytics, because if you suddenly run a hundred thousand load tests, marketing team will hate you for a couple months. The, their metrics will be all. You need to have in mind that to disable it. All right, that's a that's a good thing to know. That, that is. <laughs> Yeah, again, a, a tip for for low testing. Helping, helping one team ruining life for another one. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we ourselves have a similar case because uh, we have a, a, an example test that just opens uh, loaderror.com and uh, that's it. That's basically the whole test. And some of our users, they will try to use the example test. So when I look into the analytics, like, the biggest uh, amount of the users use uh, Linux. Like, you know, 50% <laughs> of our visitors are on Linux and developers. Chrome. Yeah, they are developers. But in fact, of course, they are not. They are actually load error test participants running on Linux. They are not real people. So this is uh, the same for the load testing. Uh, you see the spike in traffic. Uh, did your marketing do great? Did they do something? Let's find out if it's scalable. Let's do more of this. No, we're just doing lot testing. <laughs> if you are like at the end of the year and you want to get better results for marketing, you ask for low testing and then <laughs> Can you, get some oh, spikes. That's, that's, but that might be like a... Look, we are not recommending this. This is no. just for the jokes, but that there, there might be a business case, right? <laughs> to generate fake... Traffic. In case you will try to do this for your YouTube channel, YouTube will not count those views. Ah, uh, 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 sorry. So sad. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how he knows that it's not an actual user. There, there are a lot of ways uh, how how automation is detected. Um, generally, generally, like um, browser developers like uh, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, and so on, they are preparing that people will be doing automation on them. They are putting in mechanisms to help automate stuff, but at the same time, they are very aware of automation. And like for us, one of the big, biggest blockers can be CAPTCHA, because CAPTCHA is specifically in place to block automation and sometimes people come like hey why, why, why can't you fill just the cap just fill the captcha like automate a click on the yeah, checkbox yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm like, not a it, robot i'm not a robot <laughs> exactly <laughs> yes like it, it's specifically meant to, to stop automation so there is no way we can we can work around it. but that's the problem for all automation like you want to do a ui automation performance test anything it it, you, it either needs to be disabled on your test environment or you need to disable it in production for some time. And then every time you need to repeat a test, you need to disable it, repeat a test, enable it. Really tough. Don't do all load testing on production. Well, <laughs> maybe not on night. If the client wants and he heard my arguments and he still wants it, what can I do? He pays the money, he orders the music, I just dance. You know, it's our responsibility to do a little bit of education. If the person really wants the low test on the production, we can do it and we will do it. But but, but it's our duty to say that yes. you are not supposed no, So it's as I said, he practice. heard my arguments. He just chose to ignore them. Well, so I, I believe this was uh, Lodero was at first a framework you created for solving specific uh, customer problem. When did you have an idea that you can productionize that? So, yeah, we kind of we kind of started uh, work on Lodero. As you said, to solve a customer's problem. And um, Lodero originated in Tesla Lab. Um, 
and Test Lab had been building customer specific frameworks for a while. And in most cases, when we do a framework like that, it belongs to the customer because we're working under a contract for him. In this case, we somehow decided to try a different route and like do it as our own framework, um, not going under the customer's contract. So uh, that, that was kind of the first step that almost laid the foundation that this could be uh, scaled up to, to be for made for multiple customers. But um, yeah, we started out with a single customer that we knew uh, had a use case for this framework. Um, and once the framework was stable enough for that one customer to use on a daily basis, uh, at that point we we were able to start thinking about, okay, like how do we add more customers at, at first internally? How, how do we turn other people to use this? And once once we decided that, okay, there are another internal customer, another internal customer at that point, yeah, we can, uh, we can buy a domain name and uh, put it out to public. Uh, what challenges did you face the, that, that were high enough that motivated you to create a, a product? Well, I mean, basically you got a problem, right? Uh, usually you check the market, see if some kind of tool fits, right? And if nothing fits, then you are just need, you are forced to do a tool. Was, uh, how was it in, in this case for you? Um, I mean, in the beginning, as you said, we, we checked the market and we kind of saw that nothing really fits, fits the hand. So at that point, we knew our requirements. We knew what we had to do. And the beginning, beginning of the project was uh, quite simple in the sense that we had a lot to do and nothing done yet. So we, we could just get going, get working for a couple months straight without thinking a lot uh, because we had like uh, so many requirements. It needs to do this, it needs to do that, it needs to do something else. And we're just add, adding, adding, adding. Uh, we obviously did, did chat with uh, other colleagues on their experience on hey, how, how to do the architecture better, do, doing some peer reviews of the architecture and the code and everything. Do you uh, remember the actual problems that, well, the actual uh, issues that nobody offered in the market? Like, I don't know, they couldn't scale enough, they couldn't cover the UI part, or they were expensive, for example? Well, the, the issue we saw is uh, one thing was that the reporting we didn't feel was sufficient enough. Uh, so that, that's kind of, kind of the main part, like to, to see the reports. Like generating the load is one thing, but uh, you you could do that with with a very simple piece of code. Um, getting getting statistics out of it that's the tricky part to do it. And um, like we started we started in a WebRTC niche, uh, running WebRTC tests. And for WebRTC there are a lot of challenges there. And um, what other tools? didn't do is they didn't scale at all. Uh, th those tools went up to a couple hundred of uh, users and that was it. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to go into thousands and then tens of thousands. And uh, we've gotten close to 100,000 concurrent users in a single test as well. So th those were the challenges that kind of pushed us towards making our own solution. Um, but yeah, one of the things was that we, we could essentially, if someone comes to us, someone comes to the parent company and says, hey, uh, we saw your tool, we like it, but uh, it, it lacks one key feature for us, then uh, what we can do is if we went to the market, we, we would have to look for another tool, another provider, or maybe combine multiple tools to, to accomplish our goal. In our case, we can tailor it as we like. Oh, like because it's your own, you can exactly the yeah. features. Like you kind of have to know the balance at which point you want to use third party solution, at which point you want to create your own. And like developers do have this problem all the time. Do I use this library to do some, I don't know, string uh, manipulation or do I create my own solution for it? Like pros and cons in each case. Yeah, that's good questions. And uh, in our case, we just decided that, hey, we want the control for ourselves. 
we want to be able to go to a customer and say, hey, yeah, we can do it. It's two months out maybe, but uh, we will do it. And we're still trying to do it uh, to this day as well. That if, if a customer comes to us and says, hey, I've got a specific problem and uh, I don't see any tool uh, dealing with it, but uh, do you offer it? And sometimes we have to say, sadly, we don't offer the solution, but uh, if you're patient enough, if, if it's not due tomorrow, then next uh, Wednesday, yeah, then uh, then uh, let's uh, let's have a chat in another month's time and we might have a solution for you. I would like to hear what is the story? Can you uh, like in, instead of going to the details, can you give me like a, a timeline, right? So you created a project, you uh, created a framework for that project. You saw that it's good enough. You decided to release it. What what followed then? So we started back then and at first I was uh, writing it all on my own, just having some peer reviews from other colleagues at the company. And I think it went around one year that we were building the main framework for that one single customer uh, because we, ha we had the need, we saw that there's still a lot of stuff lacking. And uh, then after that one year, we were comfortable enough pushing it to other people as well and showing it to other people. Oh, so after one year, it was good enough. Like you can see it and I don't feel shame. <laughs> well, it, it was still shameful because I had to write all front end and then and, and I don't have like the mind for that. I'm not even a designer. I'm not a JavaScript. I don't JavaScript and I don't get along too well. <laughs> But um, yeah, and at that point, uh, we also started to grow a team slowly, person by person. Um, and in Tesdale Lab, we're, Tesdale Lab is always uh, hiring people. And sometimes, uh, sometimes when when HR gets a good candidate that they just can't let go, but there's not yet a pro project for him, he got assigned to to Lodero. And so, oh, so you were like a placeholder for, <laughs> yeah, at, at one point in, in the history, we were a placeholder, like we got a person for a couple of months, then, then we had to let that person go. But, uh, still most of the time we had, we got some value out of it. I think the shortest career was two hours in our project, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, he, he, the person, sorry if the inter, but the person came in like at nine or 10, like the yeah. first day usually <laughs> and after the lunch, uh, sorry. Wrong seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was pretty much the case. Uh, but uh, yeah, some some people stuck in the project. Uh, some of them are still here in the company. Uh, right now, we're around 15 people. Um, like, we, we get some new people uh, every now and then. So I don't know an exact date of as of today. Not date, number, sorry. Um, but yeah, we, we slow, we're slowly growing the team. We haven't done like a, an enormous hiring um, round at the same time. Like, I don't know, we need 10 new people today. We're just getting people one by one and slowly growing the team. And But um, at the same, when you said like, you showed the UI, right? It was not the best one, right? So at what time, like, uh, there was a need to, you know, to have a designer, to redo the UI, to, I don't know, show it to the architect or someone like, is the architecture really is correct? Like if you a hundred thousand users, so I imagine that it, there had been some scaling to be done. Right. And, uh, so. Uh, we had a designer helping us uh, part-time from pretty much the start of UI itself. But but we had the problem that we were talking about before, like how do we know what the users will do? How do we make the UI such that users will understand? Because there is no such tool in the market. They don't have past experience on it. So how do we create a tool that is intuitive and so on and so forth? Um, because we ourselves understand the tool. Uh, we had one customer who was also there from the ground floor, so he understands the tool. So you had an example of two, right? Yeah, we Me, had an... myself and one customer. <laughs> and one customer that also knows how to do everything from API. So UI for him is 
uh, almost irrelevant. Also, it's like an advanced user, right? Using the terminal only. Exactly. So we didn't have any clue. So we just went for it. Uh, we had the first version out. Uh, we, we showed it. Then, then we started also pushing it to other internal customers. And then we had some feedback. But um, I think we were in total two or three people in the team at the time. So when somebody came to us and said, hey, I like the, this, the idea, but you should like change the UI completely. Like we've, we've been working for, I don't know, four or five months at that point on the UI alone. And like for us to suddenly decide, okay, we're going to stop all other development and change the UI would have been, would have been quite a terrible decision. But uh, yeah, then, then we slowly started to gather uh, more feedback. Uh, we often did rounds of uh, internal um, feedback, such that to show the tool to other colleagues of ours that hadn't seen it before and said like, hey, this is a load testing tool and I want you to go and create a test now. Oh, so hey, look, a new guy. Yeah, Come exactly. Come here, you, you've never seen this. And then people with cameras like, mm -hmm. what is he pressing? <laughs> Oh, well, new guys are actually quite bad at it because they they don't know they don't know testing at all. Okay. So they they if I say create a test, they they're thinking like, okay, what what does test mean? Ah, uh, wrong new guy. Yeah, wrong new guy. <laughs> you need experienced tester, but new in this company. And and right now for us, like we're so used to the tool that everything is natural to us still. And whenever a new guy comes into the team. It's like, hey, if you see something suspicious, something you don't understand, something that looks weird, maybe there's even a bug that uh, we're so used to it, we're not noticing and we're ignoring it. Just let us know because we're not seeing that stuff anymore. Yeah, that's that's true. And as a business, you probably had some kind of metrics say, in order to make sure that, okay, so do we need to pull the plug or like we keep going? So do you, did you have any kind of metrics like goals? Um, well, at first it was a framework, so it was made for that specific customer. That customer is actually still a customer of ours, even after these five years. And so the, the first um, like motivation to keep going was that, hey, we kind of promised him and we, we need to keep the promise. Um, and Around the time after Pavel's joined, uh, we also started pushing the product more out to external people more. And um, after that, we, we could also start to see like somewhat reasonable revenue growth of the product and, and like make at least some future projections on, okay, we're here now, this is our expenses, that's our income, and what, what do we need to do in order to keep growing and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, I think I think that one of the key factors that helped us to be successful was that, that one customer kept with us because there had been other experiments at similar products. Well, not similar products, but uh, other products in uh, Test Lab. Not all of them succeeded, right? Yeah, like Test Lab had tried to create multiple products. Um, Sometimes when engineers didn't have a project assigned that, hey, let's just try this one. Or sometimes also based on customer need, but it quite often turns out that, hey, that, that customer has such a specific need that you can't really do a general product on it. And that's a challenge we also had to like face with that, that first customer that he had kind of specific needs and how do we turn those needs into something uh, that that looks like a product made for for the market instead of that one customer? But um, yeah, as as we were able to start thinking from it from day one, we we were a little bit thinking about that, but still focusing on a customer. Uh, how did you come up with the name? Uh, a couple of beers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, it, it's not. I don't. I don't think it's a, a super interesting story. Uh, it's. But it does mean something like load. I get it. Arrow. 
Uh, or just like, oh, no, let's it's, find it's, something it's catch. It's not giant. It's like still, it's, it's just a, a single, I don't know, name that, that goes together. Like, I, I don't have a, an example that, that I can relate to, but uh, we've had, I had other options on like, I don't know, elephant testing or something like that. Elephant? Yeah, because it's heavy. It's low. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, pretty smart. Yeah. So was there any more uh, possible names? Uh, there probably were, but I, I don't okay. recall them. Like at, 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 at first, I had a list of around ten semi-decent ideas. Then I filtered them out on okay, this domain is not available. This is something <laughs> else uh, already, and like this doesn't work out. Um, How long did it took? It, it took uh, till the list uh, contained single entry, which uh, became it, it was quite quick actually because uh, we had a technical uh, requirement that we. It was a good time to introduce a name because at first it was uh, project X. Yeah, it was a uh, tester something something. And uh, like at one point you had so many references to that in the code base and obviously it couldn't be just tester. Uh, so at that point, I think it was some kind of a migration we were doing and like I realized, okay, if, I, if we want to change now, this is like the best time for it because we're already doing a lot of changes in that side. So I had, I think I had one or two evenings to come up with it and then go to the management. Hey, does this sound good? Yeah, sure. Let's go with it. So just a note to our listeners. So if you want to start on a project and you're stuck on the step one name, you can do it later. <laughs> Not too late, I, I, of course. Yeah. So um, when you started a project, I have a, one more question. When uh, did you start to think about the revenues? I mean, the project is cool. It works, right? How will it generate money? Did you had to like, was this clear from the beginning or at some point have you thought and like, like in that movie, Office Space, <laughs> you know, when like one day they just check the bank account and oh, it generated lots of money. <laughs> like it's too good. <laughs> well, it, it's not that that bright uh, for us because it, it's kind of a niche. So the niche, it has customers, it has enough customers. It, it's, it doesn't have tens of thousands of customers, unfortunately, or at least they haven't found us yet. Um, like for us, it was relatively easy. It was clear from the beginning what would be the revenue in income for, for us because uh, like, okay, for each load test, we have uh, associated variable costs of like servers and everything. But uh, it also had the clear idea that, okay, we have server costs. So it's e super easy to justify that, okay, we're charging based on how much do you load test. And it, it was then just a matter of doing enough load tests in a month to be to sustainable. Cover. Okay. Because, you know, sometimes people create a great product, but they cannot make it generate enough yeah, money. I still don't understand how Twitter makes money. <laughs> yeah. Some companies are strange. <laughs> so you mentioned that the load error is a SaaS product. W what's SaaS? So SaaS is software as a service, means it is a software tool that you or any other person can use in your browser. So you basically create an account, log in at loadero.com, and there is this user interface that allows you to create and run the test and get the results. So in the perfect world, we could just uh, sit relaxed. People would find out about Loadero, create an account, run some tests, pay us the money, and we just sit there happy because the business works. But in real world, it is not always the case. So it, it is a software as a service, it means our users actually create and run those tests themselves, sometimes without interaction with us. Uh, but usually they require some support and onboarding and stuff like that. But we still have to provide the service. So we are still a service provider for load testing. Because, uh, and this is the big difference between the project and the product. When we're working in a project, we're a team of people and all of us know how Loader works. All of us know how we can create a test, how we can manipulate it to tailor to our needs. But uh, now we go to the market and here come the new people. They have never seen this. They have no previous experience, but they have the need. 
and Loader would uh, actually be a fit for it, so it would solve their problems. But uh, sometimes they are not capable to create the test, and uh, it was and likely it is the case that there is the shortage for experienced uh, IT people, including the quality assurance engineers. So there are businesses that do need load testing and they understand that they do need load testing. And they have one, two, maybe more quality assurance engineers who wear a lot of hats and they can't fit one more into their daily routine. And uh, here's the management of the service. They understand they need the load test. They come to us and they ask, us, can you do this for us? Can you do the test creation? So in this case, we provide the software as a service and we also use it in order to make the test for our customers because of different reasons. They might be short of manpower, they might not have the person with the relevant skills for that. So it's not the perfect world situation when we look at the bank account and see how the revenue grows there. We still need to work there and provide the support provide the advice, sometimes provide the white glove solution to the customers and just provide the report after uh, the What is the white glove solution? So uh, it's uh, our customers sitting in white gloves. Ah, uh, so they don't need to uh, do anything. Like they stay clean the... till the very end and I we see. do all the dirty work and just provide the results. I see. So if you provide software as a service, you probably have some SLAs uh, defined for the customers. Uh, what they're going to receive uh, as an agreement that, for a service. So there, are of course, are terms and conditions, but on one hand to provide the seamless experience, on the other hand to cut the manual work we have to do, we don't uh, sign a contract with each user of Loadero. Uh, it would take an army of people working just uh, on that. Big legal department. Uh, yes, yes. So basically, as with other software as a service solutions that you use be it for i don't know emails uh, or marketing or development you just create an account you put that uh, little tick that you agree to the terms and conditions maybe you even opened those terms and conditions at some point but uh, you confirm that you have read them but you should everyone should read everything yeah, I promise uh, you don't owe us one million dollars if you create an account in Loadero. But uh, every now and then you should take a look at what you agree. So we don't sign those contracts for the standard usage. And as we provide uh, the free trial to the users, means that users come there to Loadero, create an account, run a test, and we don't get anything. We just provide the service to them. And it, it is a seamless transition once they agree to use it for uh, for money as a paid plan user but there are different cases as well so if there is a user with a specific needs who needs some additional development or if that's a user who requires our service of creating the test for them or it's the user that plans big amount of load tests and their scale is different so we can offer some kind of a discount if there is anything special about the deal Obviously, there will be an agreement, a contract that has all the information about pricing, about our responsibility, what service we provide, what service we don't provide. So it is the case for some users, but if your needs are very basic or if you're just exploring, we don't bother you with signing any papers. But just make sure to read the terms and conditions before uh, agree to them. And what is the highest load you can generate? Like, there are some limitations, right? Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. So Artus mentioned that it's somewhere close to 100,000 concurrent users, which is, uh, as I think, an impressive number. But we didn't have a test with that exact number. So we did have bigger tests for multiple tens of thousands of concurrent users. And they worked, but it means that we kind of can run a bigger test, but we don't know where this limit is. And the reason for this, on one hand, is we just didn't have the case to measure it. Uh, so we didn't have a customer who was about to run 150,000 uh, tests. Or if there is the user who wants over 100,000 
and we think to ourselves okay it's time to see what is our limit likely the low service test will fail low to yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah dog fooding we're thinking about that uh, that phrase you said quite a lot like are we low testing or low testing solution enough and like most of the time like pe when people come and they find a tool on the web they run their tests on their own they're not going past like 10 20 maybe 30,000 users at the same time yeah, that's quite high already yeah but uh, so we're very comfortable with people from outside running 20,000 users like I, I still remember the first time we launched 200 users it almost felt like we need to go get the champagne um, right now 20,000 is like oh yeah cool nice um, we are quite comfortable that we can go above 50k easily um, but those people that actually want those 50k they mostly do come to us and contact us beforehand because we've also made the uh, like the pricing plans and everything in such a way that hey if you go above this number you you're required to contact us so so we can make sure that even if if we feel that it should be fine we can just keep an eye on it and in case support the customer and um, we're obviously doing improvements and changes to the platform all the time so if we were doing low test of our solution all the time it would not only eat up all the monthly profits but all the monthly revenue just on making sure that the changes we did we still can handle i don't know 110,000 users even if we don't have the business case for it just yet so when a customer comes to us and asks we have a rough estimate of how many we think we should be able to handle and then when somebody comes and actually asks for that number then we can say like okay you wanted million users we will not do a million but we can offer you hundred thousand or whatever and then we can have a discussion with the, with the customer and see like okay can we do it does does it matter to him or maybe some people actually come and say like i want to do a million users and then we start chatting with him okay i actually need only 60k <laughs> but maybe one day there will be a million yeah exactly like he, he knows that i have a million monthly active users and then when you divide it to, to daily active users oh it's only 35k oh okay let's do that so I guess as a business working for multiple years, you did have some issues and bugs. Uh, can you share the most memorable ones? Um, obviously, we, we've had a lot of bugs in our, of our own, um, but uh, we also actually have quite a lot of customer experience uh, that, that we can tap into for this. I don't know off the top of my head, like any, any super memorable maybe bugs. Uh, generally generally we've been trying to fix everything as soon as we can obviously and we've been able to do it since we're still a rather small team but yeah as, as from the from the customer side i think some of the most interesting ones have been doing a load test of tens of thousands of users and then getting an email from the marketing department that hey your google analytics just quadrupled overnight so realizing that and ultimately uh, uh, we considered that we hadn't considered it but it kind of falls off on our responsibility to to think about how how, how we're now going to solve this issue and uh, we also kind kind of solved it but it is a hard thing to to figure out and but um yeah i, I don't think i've had other other projects in my experience that have had some funnier bugs so sadly sadly nothing super funny in this we, one yeah, yeah like well we luckily maybe not sadly <laughs> yeah it, it's not really a bug but uh i think we we wanted to add a feature uh for firefox browsers and uh we even had a chat with uh people from Mozilla and they said hey guys you it's impossible to do it like Mozilla doesn't have this feature we kept looking and it turned out that it's a simple solution of uh, compiling your own kernel to do this so simple solution of <laughs> yeah like af after many days of investigation like oh you only need to compile a kernel to do it 
And uh, now we have a person working on that problem and he's spent, I think, close to a month already on that one problem. Like it, if it works out, it will be a great solution, but I think there are still about 20 things that can go wrong and, and that we can't just deal with. So even if the creator said that it's impossible, if you keep uh, trying to solve it long enough, it, nothing is impossible. Yeah, like ask me that in a couple months, I will make, tell you for sure. I will wait for a success post on yeah, I'll, I'll post a comment on the video. <laughs> Yeah. I sold it, so, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that bug is one that not the bug, but feature request is one of the oldest ones we have in our backlog. So, <laughs> okay. so it's there for a couple of years already. Okay. The next year, the year after that, who Should, knows? If if by the end of the next year we will not see the comment, we'll write you down to ask if everything is all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. So during those five years, you probably learned some lessons and uh, what would you do differently now when you know them? Um, I mean, actually, I don't think I, I should have done anything differently because all of that came down to the experience that I have right now. And like, obviously, it's best to learn from somebody else's mistakes and so on. But you learn actually the best from your own mistakes. Um, but um, from from product perspective, I think what I've learned so far is that I'm I'm best at my thing, and then there are other people that are best at their own thing. Like I I did try developing a front end side to realize that nope, totally not my thing. Uh, so I'm right now I'm staying away from all of that stuff. Uh, the same actually goes for. All the marketing, like I hate it to write text for all the landing pages and everything else. Like I still hate it. And thankfully I don't have to do it anymore. I leave that to other people that do it better than me. So that that's something that I realized that I, I have to like, I and everybody else should lean on experience and knowledge of other people. Like you, you could do all of the stuff kind of well, but um, I, I've figured out that it's better to focus maybe on that one your thing. Yes, it's a niche, and if if you suddenly have to change jobs, maybe then it's harder to find that one niche. But then you're very good at that niche and what, very good at what you're doing. So I think that's that's the main thing that I've learned. Like there are a lot of mistakes that we made all, all over the years, but a lot of that was just trial and error and like. Let, let's do it and see if it works out. Like we're still when debating about some decisions on, hey, should we do like option A or option B? Like, okay, let's just go with B and see if it works out. Well, if it doesn't, it doesn't. Like we'll never know one until we try it. Yeah, A-B testing, right? <laughs> yeah, like exactly. Yeah, I mean, we need to try it and see if it works. Nice. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Do you have anything else to add? Like you joined uh, more recently, so and you saw the product like how it is. Maybe you would have liked that it would be a little bit different. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was kind of this feeling, but uh, we used it a lot to our benefit. So I, I came there very new to the team, very new to the product, very new to the quality assurance industry itself. And here is the product we're trying to offer to the market. And here am I, not understanding anything about it, but that's good because I have the same perspective as a very new user has. So what I try to do is I try to use it as if I need to run some tests, read the documents, uh, find some examples and uh, fail there to understand, okay, documents didn't cover this and we must cover this in order to help the users succeed. Uh, okay, this is not very intuitive. And that's the difference between people working in the project. They know all the ins and outs. And I see it for the first time and I don't understand how it works. It uh, also, uh, you can also see a lot of this in the wording and naming and terms. What seems obvious to a person who created this doesn't make sense for a person who sees it for the first time. 
So it kind of explains the feature, its name, but it should explain it to you when you are very new to this and you just read it and you must understand what this mean. So uh, it's good to have someone who doesn't understand what the product is yet in the team. And that's my opinion. Uh, but it's good not in terms of the business value, but in terms that you can extract the actual valuable information from this experience. So I think it played pretty nice role to us. And as the loader was a project for internal use, it was carrying this heritage. And when I came to it, uh, I thought like, okay, it is a product, but how do we sell it? We don't have this, we don't have that. These things seem obvious, we must have them. Well, we don't have them because it wasn't a product before. So we are starting to add them from scratch, uh, one after another. Some work better, others don't. After half a year, I look back and think, did I do this half a year ago? That's a shame. I have to redo it like from scratch, not improving it. You shouldn't do it like that. But it's for your own benefit. In the end of the day, it worked for half a year. It helped some people. So it's not uh, entirely a you know, thing you don't need. You just uh, need to do your job better, like evolve in it. Yeah, always improving, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like I'm still looking at a code that I wrote one year ago and thinking like, man, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but Who wrote this nonsense? Oh, oh. <laughs> But but I, I, I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking on the bright side of it. That means I've grown over the last year. I've learned new stuff. I've learned maybe not so, what not to do and what to do. So that means I'm growing as a person, as a developer, and uh, so I, I find it good. Like the, the point when I look at the code I wrote year back and think like, man, this is some good code. That means I haven't done a real good job in the last year. Damn, I was smart last year. It's beautiful. <laughs> Nobody said <that> ever. <laughs> so with your experience you had uh, making it from framework to product, what kind of advices you can give to everyone else who is uh, thinking the same way, we're working on the framework, and they're thinking, hey, could, this could be a product. So do you have any advice for them? Yeah, so I think one of the key things key things for our success is that we had that one customer and it wasn't just uh, like a customer for a brief while and and so it's still he's still a customer and um, that means we've we got somebody that we can uh, get feature requests from because uh, we, we can always think about the stuff that I think this is very valuable which probably actually is not like it it seems that hey it would be so nice if we had i don't know pie charts nobody cares about them actually like it's it's just something you can brag about but nobody actually needs them um so having an actual customer uh defining the needs like whenever we're running out of ideas we just look at what customers have asked us and just pick one of those because that means there's actual need for those things and it's not like we're trying to guess what is the what is the market requiring we're just looking at it we we have we have enough right now requests of some specific features um and then and, and yeah i think some of the biggest struggles that we didn't really anticipate in making it it a product that we're selling uh is that the product part also uh, at this point takes more time than than the specific like nitty-gritty details um, creating a load testing framework was was uh, a big challenge at the beginning but right now I would say that it takes like 20% of our time like the rest of the time is spent at like prettifying the UI because people want like pretty UIs and pretty buttons and animations and everything else. Uh, we're writing documentation a lot. That that takes an enormous amount of time. We're also working on like general project management because when it is a framework, you're just running it. You you don't care about this project or that project. Like you, you create a clone for every single project. But uh, right now we have so many projects that it's it's not feasible at all. 
So you have to incorporate like project management, dealing with billing, that's a real pain. And like, it's also quite scary because you can't mess up with that. Like, I don't know if you mess up and like report the percentages a bit incorrectly, like, oh, sorry, my bad. But if you mess up with billing and realize like, oh God, I need to return, I don't know, even if it's a couple hundred dollars, but then the accounting is haunting you for the next year or so because of those $100, because like, so the invoices need to be changed and that needs to be changed. All of that stuff actually takes up quite a lot. At the beginning, yes, it's it's the it's the framework. So maybe maybe even if it, it's possible to to give out a unique copy to each user you have, but when you start think, okay, we I want to put them all together, make it all automated and everything, then it becomes actually a very different kind of challenge. It, it almost becomes boring, kind of. Because like you had like that big challenge for us. It was a big challenge. Okay, we want to run ten thousand users now. Like we need to spin up so many servers to do it. We we have to spin up them quickly because each minute costs money, and so on. Like that's that's an interesting challenge. And now the challenge we have: okay, we have results. We need to implement filters. We need to implement sorting and stuff like that. So it's it's, it's not big enough. It's not exciting. It it needs to be done because because also like I'm I'm trying to think about. If I was in the market of looking, of searching for this tool, I found this tool and, I don't know, five other competitors. Would I choose this tool? And what are the things that I'm looking at? I'm looking at documentation, uh, examples on how can I use, how can I use APIs, for example? And thinking about, does this apply to us? And do we need to improve on this stuff? Sorry, I'm laughing because I thought that, uh, because you mentioned the UI and filters a lot. And if I'm on the market looking for a tool, right? So for me, it reminds a little bit like uh, uh, some dating app, right? Where it's <laughs> like you open, if you like the UI, better tool, worse tool. <laughs> yeah. But, but so that's why you need to... But still, like, to if you see some looks... clunky UI that looks like it came out of 2004, that, that, that makes you think like, okay, is it maintained? Is it still relevant? Like, okay, the UI is clunky. Is the backend better? Is the, the actual load generation part? But you need to invest the time, create a scenario, and it, it, it requires time to check out or to see that beautiful backend. Th- those all small things combined together in, in the overall user experience and whether or not you would choose this tool because like, if, if you run... 10 participants, it's fine to get a table with the stats, right? If you run 10,000 participants and you want to find, I don't know, the, the one participant that had like the highest, I don't know, network usage, right? Okay, finding that one is, is okay, but then you need to sort those 10,000 by network usage and then, oh, those, uh, the most usages for Google Chrome, I'll, I'll filter those out and look only for Mozilla Firefox. Like doing that again manually, of course you can do it. But everything is possible. Everything's so. possible, right? But at the time when the twenty second customer comes to you and asks for the same thing, like, hey, I want to filter out all Google Chromes, like they were relevant, but now I want to look at Firefox only. After twenty customers ask you, like you realize like, okay, I we need to do it. We, it's we time to automate it. Exactly. And and it's it's not it's not the big challenge like it's not the big technical challenge that you sit at at the whiteboard and think like okay how how are we going to do it? It's like okay yeah we you just need to add uh, filters on the database so it's it's but it needs to be done. Any advices from business and marketing perspective? Well, this may sound like a generic advice, but uh, you have to think about it. You have to walk a distance in your customer's shoes be- before you have the customers. What seems obvious to you and what seems intuitive will not seem intuitive. So you need to try to look at your framework as you are looking at a new product from the perspective of person who wants to use it and has the need but has no idea how it works. And now that you are not a framework but a product 
it's your job to provide this information, to make sure this user journey is smooth, to make sure all the uh, objections are handled and all the questions are answered and all the feature requests are taken into consideration. Uh, that's the important part. Also, um, you know, if you are uh, like a generic startup, you just starting the business, you already know it is a business. You already think, okay, how will we at some point start generating the revenue? But when you are working on this project uh, and now you have to think how you will generate that, uh, you have some ideas, but be ready that some of them will not work. Even if they are genuinely good ideas, even if they are industry standard or best practice of a kind, they might not work for you for the reasons you can't predict. Uh, to give you an example, uh, my target audience uh, is mainly developers and quality assurance engineers. They are people with experience in the IT field and uh, people with experience in IT field and other people as well. Everybody hates advertising, right? So you can do a lot of advertising for, I don't know, a fitness app on social media, the context uh, and stuff like that. And you can approach your target audience this way, but if it's developers, they know how to block the ad. <laughs> so likely it's trickier to reach them than the audience of say the fitness app. So get ready that uh, the things that are obvious and are good will not work for you. So you will have to come up with something else then. I see. And it's really good that uh, well, from what both of you told, though, what I hear is that uh, it's really fun and exciting at the beginning because you're building, building, putting new features. But then at some point it changes and you need to get other people into your project to solve the problems because uh, I can feel that you're a technical person, right? And you want to, well, the same to do what I like to do, like just create content, create, create something new beautiful and then ah oh, you need to write a guide how to use it oh no you need to update it because someone needs but it's all project it's not important not interesting there are more exciting things to do but you have to wait for them so i kind of understand that uh from my perspective yeah th there are always new challenges that uh, we are pursuing and that I, I think every every project should pursue some new challenges new avenues but like that, that uh, if at the beginning it was 90% pursuing that big challenge, now it's 10% effort going to that new challenge and the rest is going to all the other activities. Like, uh, okay, we, we created that amazing backend solution. Now we need to create a front end for it. Like we need to create charts for it. Like eh, it's just charts from the perspective of the task you did previously, right? Yeah. So it's like the same, like you, you uh, climb the Mount Everest and now you go to, I don't know. Now you need to climb down. <laughs> no, you just, you see any hill in Latvia or Lithuania, we don't have many hills and like, we're, go, we're going hiking and you're like prepared for everything and you're just, is this it? <laughs> it's not even a mountain, <laughs> something like that. Maybe you can uh, add a challenge and climb a tree on top of the mountain. So it's it's something new. It's and something new. You can climb on hands. <laughs> on yeah. hands. On hands, like walking <laughs> hands, like only. That's <laughs> new. <laughs> so we talked uh, about the, the story of the product, right? Of the framework to product. And now let's cover something that is interesting uh, to me personally. So and maybe for the listeners too. So imagine that I run a performance test of some sort or low test and I did everything right and uh, that tool generated me a report, right? I have a response time, error count, maybe the throughput, something maybe so that the memory increased a little bit to 139% or so, but then it decreased. So, uh, is there any guide or help how to interpret the results? And maybe if the customers come to you to that white glove uh, solution, right? So you give them the report. So it probably needs more explaining than just displaying the numbers. So how, how would you interpret the report or how would you explain it to the customer? Mm, yeah, I think the answer is actually quite boring that it really depends on, on the situation. 
but um, but I think the the broader the broader answer is that um, you you have to set your expectations. Um, you will not be able to cover all the bases. It, it's just uh, impossible. Also, from general testing uh, perspective, like you can't always test everything. Uh, even if it's I don't know VAT calculation, like you can test different numbers, but you will never test all numbers, right? So it, it's kind of something similar that you have to set the expectations. Okay, how much do I test? How far do I go? What specifically do I test? And in case of that performance testing, it's setting those expectations and um, just setting that, okay, I will be testing on this browser, on this device, on on, on, on this network. Uh, for us, it's also, for example, uh, from which uh, geographic location you're testing because even, even right now it's uh, differences between US and Europe that we talked about uh, like some sites have different UIs in, in both regions so setting expectations with which site are we testing maybe for US you have some analytics that are that are not compliant with uh, European an analytics are the analytics enabled in Europe? Is, is the cookie banner just accepted or maybe it's rejected? How, how does that change everything? And you just, it's just a quite uh, unreasonable to expect to test everything. And um, so I think the best uh, way to avoid disappointment is to, to try to be very clear to everybody what, what are the testing scenario, what are we doing right now? So if you go to the business people that request the testing, um, if, even if they don't understand and just uh, agree to whatever you're saying, you, like uh, our approach is that to be very clear that, hey, we're doing this. If it's not fine for you, please, please tell us so. Because again, like when we look at those white gloves situation, the customer kind of expects us to do everything and, and we can rely on some past experience on on what's what's a better route to go in each case but un unless we are working on the product of theirs for a couple months at least we don't know it as well as they do maybe if they if they say that oh we don't have analytics or yeah we do but uh we we can't get them in time for you like okay that means we're just relying on our gut feeling and it, it can be wrong and we're just being uh, open about that. We're telling the customer, okay, we think that this is the best approach, but we can be wrong. Like, it, it's okay to be wrong. All right, but I'm asking, like, if I run the results, right, and, like, most of the tools I use, they generate some kind of report, right? It contains the error counts, right? So, uh, for example, what error count is acceptable margin? Or does the customer uh, well, need to tell you? Yeah, that's the thing I'm, I'm kind of saying. Like it, it very much depends on, on, for example, the purpose of the testing. So maybe you just want to, to like push a lot of users and you don't care that they don't get past login maybe. So if you don't care, then, then their rate might be very high that you're okay with. I understand now. Like Sad. <laughs> Yeah, there is no silver bullet. Yes, it's, unfortunately. It's always, yeah, yeah. That, that's the always thing. No silver bullet. Why? I want it. I want simple answers to complicated questions. Is it too much to ask? And like, <laughs> uh, ideally, obviously, like, if you want an, an like, universal answer, then I, I would say that the error rate should be zero. Like, ah. obviously. <laughs> but uh, th then it depends on, like, how critical is the application? Like, if, if you're talking about NASA rockets, then yeah, then probably, probably zero. it has to be uh, super close to zero. Or, or, or uh, ambulance, also probably lower numbers. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that needs to be quite low. If you're talk talking about, I don't know, um, I don't, ticket sales, right? Especially airplane ticket sales, like one or two tickets here and there. Eh, more mostly fine okay, okay yeah exactly like especially like seat allocation happens later so you don't really care maybe he will, won't come to the plane so oh yeah but uh, that's uh, actually an interesting issue that's overbooking but uh, let's leave it for another <laughs> topic yeah exactly so it, it really depends on on what you find acceptable and like 
I think it's not also the engineer's responsibility to say that, okay, it's fine for, I don't know, 0.5% of purchases to fail or to, to have the wrong item assigned. Ideally, it should be zero. Yeah, but you know, uh, I'm, uh, why I'm asking this question is that uh, you, you put a table, you, you write the numbers and then the project manager, yeah, but what does it mean? Like, I don't know, you asked to do a performance test. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not a technical person. You, you should explain me. Is this something that we should fix? Uh, you have to do market analysis for that. Yeah, but uh, you have they to, have yeah. to do market analysis for that, not me. <laughs> so I guess this is also what mentioned that the, you can't take all the hats, right, as a test yeah. engineer and you exactly. have to pass on something like, okay, this is above my pay grade. I don't have an experience in that. I don't want to spend half a year to learn that. So we maybe need to... So, yeah, if it's an objective problem like calculating tax rate, then there is one right answer. But if it's a subjective problem, uh, I don't know, trading, trading uh, memory usage for network, it's, it's the optimization of the application. You can endlessly optimize. You can optimize for network, you can optimize for memory. So we're never saying that, hey, you should focus on memory because maybe it's a specifically network-focused application. So it very much depends on the on the business side. It, it very much depends on that. A Thank lot. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. I understand now. <laughs> Unfortunately. No, <laughs> no solution for me. No silver bullets. Yeah, and I have another problem. Every time when I see performance results, uh, I don't trust them. And there's, I think it's a little bit about paranoia, but I think it's also healthy that if you have a test and you can support the 1,000, 10,000 users, it doesn't guarantee you that if you go live and you will have 10,000 users, it will work as expected. There, there are things that it we're still doing a test. It's a test data. It's a simulated, maybe even synthetic data we're expecting to see in the production it doesn't mean that it's a guarantee that it will be working. So every time when you have a performance result, you still need to be like, you take it with a grain of salt. It's a good verification, but it's not like bulletproof for like 100%, it will work. So I'm not sure if it's a question or just... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it sounded like a statement, but I yeah. agree. You always like, did I choose the correct scenario? Yeah. Did, will the users do this? What if the business gave me the wrong numbers? Right. Well, what if, if there the business more gave you the wrong numbers, you know who to blame. Yeah, but, but <laughs> I'm waiting. Like it's it's it's, a, it's like a, it's it's two uh, for me. It's two moments. First one is when I send an email and saying that everything is alright. Is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it? And then when you know that uh, production go live is happening, like, and you're waiting, looking to like, and someone writes a message, you open, ah, not related to the. <laughs> <laughs> It's always scary. I would uh, like to extend this to two more directions. One is, okay, you load tested, you can handle 10,000 users, but there might be this one very special user with his own vision of how to use the app. And he might, I not, might not break it, but break his user experience, be not happy. And he might be an important customer of yours. Ah. So it, it doesn't mean that you have tested all the cases. And if you created a proper load test, uh, it simulates the user scenario perfectly. Zero percent error rate, like you're the rock star, the superhero. It works perfectly. Doesn't mean that the app is like perfect and you don't need testing and load testing anymore. Not really. Like a month after that, your developers will add a new feature and it might break like everything. You should rerun the same test maybe if you want to... 100% validate you still can scale for 10,000 concurrent users, you have to rerun basically the same test again. In my experience, I had the case when uh, we also did performance testing. It was kind of fine. And we went to production. And uh, at that time, it just was a coincidence that was what, that was end of a month and the first day of, of an, like a new month. And all the managers went and get the report for last month and the system choked <laughs> like users could like users could use the system but the reporting locked everything like because they needed to collect the data and bum no, nothing is working so even that kind of case that's an edge case it's like we kind of expected that users could use the system but like on 
January 1st, bam, like everyone's pulling the whole year reports and like, phew, the system is not so working. So you, you unintentionally uh, got spot on on two spikes instead of expected one. But I didn't expect it. Like, um, Any. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just like we tested the users, but the management yeah. went for reporting and we use the same database. And, and you did, cannot tell them that you broke the yeah. system. <laughs> yeah. I think that the person who comes up with an extensive testing strategy that is feasible will become a millionaire because like we all know that it's impossible to test for everything. Yeah. Because of these specific cases, like we, we've been talking about that there will be that one specific user or maybe one specific user group that does something that you just didn't think about or does it from the other side or whatever like breaks something and uh, unfortunately that is the case that you can test for stuff and like if you if you want to test for everything you will not get to that release date so for me, performance testing was a little bit of a like crystal ball and like doing some magic. And yeah, it seems like, that I think it's, it's going to be working, but like there's no 100% guarantee. Like. I, I think it's better to just <laughs> yeah. go overboard a little bit. So if you, yeah. if you, for example, have Black Friday data from last year and you see, okay, we had like 8,000 users on that day. That's okay. You're expecting that you will have more users based on, I don't know, marketing or your average user growth. Then, okay, add another 20% on top of it just to make sure. And if, even if you get less users, then, then you'll be safe. If you get more users, then you have to think about what to do with all the money. <laughs> but it could be the case in the last year you used the pictures, for example, smaller format. And now you have 4K pictures, like really nice ones. And this year, if you open the same uh, like product page, it's going to be a different load. <laughs> and you can't have like anticipate that because it's such m many things have to fall together in order for you to like, well, this is what we expected and this is fine. Yeah, that's, that's very true. For example, yeah. the same for video. They introduce a new video format, which probably... Uh, what was it? It decreases the uh, brand which required, but it increases the load to decode the video. Yeah, like uh, I think testing load testing is kind of almost like testing I don't know a name field. When you're like a normal person, you put in your name, right? <laughs> That's it. But uh, when you're testing that field, you're like putting all the possible characters there, all emojis and everything else, right? You're trying to test for those super extreme scenarios that probably will never happen but then there will be that one user that actually puts an emoji in his name and breaks the database yeah that uh, that uh, town in uh, norway or where where the, the its name of the town is 64 random character well it's not random but <laughs> it looks like random <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So also in performance testing, like if you go above and beyond, you go to the extremes, you see, okay, normal user will do this, but let's just go and do something super crazy, super a lot. Like if you can do, uh, if you can do a stress test in that case, you're anticipating 10,000, let, let's do a 15,000 test and see what, what oh, happens. I like uh, when you'll get a chance to, you know, see at what point the application fails <laughs> yeah exactly that that's that can be a case in a lot of circumstances like okay ten thousand is the goal we got the 10k let's go let's do see, some more let's see 20. <laughs> yeah exactly like let's see 20. hey 10 was unexpectedly fine so let's do 20 and i think in our experience that the users that uh, lodera simulates are a bit harder on the system as well like they are synthetic they can the actions can be incorrect in the sense that maybe all all the users upload the same picture that that's one megabyte but real users will one uploads five kilobytes other uploads five megabytes so that that kind of stuff that that randomness you you can't really replicate it properly but um but on, on other actions, it, it seems that uh, Lodero can, specifically Lodero can uh, do a very good job in making sure that, yeah, the application will More handle that. More close to reality, right? Yeah, I think that in a, in a lot of cases, it's even that 
for low there are 10,000 is like sketchy already, but in real life, real users, it will be better. Because also getting those numbers can be quite tricky. And obviously, if you have wrong numbers, like, I don't know, oops, business missed a zero there. Like <laughs> 6,000 instead of 60. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, come on, guys. What do you expect? So today we learned uh, quite a lot of information about load testing and some tooling and how we can help and different approaches for different kind of problems. And I think we need to uh, thank our guests for joining us today and providing all the information. I think it was very valuable and we uh, might even inspire someone to actually go from framework to product. And if you do, please reach out to us and it would be very like good for us to know that we actually help someone. And thank you for all the listeners. See you uh, in another episode. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.